Coming soon this week, the latest book from Studio Brainstorm, Inferior, a sci-fi story about a man who escapes a dystopian city and finds freedom. But will freedom prove to be everything that he hoped it would be? Or could it be concealing something darker and even worse than oppression? If you find yourselves unable to wait, there are two more books already available for purchase at our website, studiobrainstorm.net. Atalanta, an adaptation of Greek mythology featuring the first female hero in fiction, and Golden Steel, a historical fiction set in feudal Japan, where a young noblewoman finds herself caught between samurai honor bound to capture her and a team of ninja hired to protect her, but could easily betray her for the right price. Thank you, and enjoy the video. There is an old intellectual dispute called nature versus nurture. In brief, the argument boils down to this. How much of a person's character is determined by environment, and how much is innate? This concept can also be broadened out to cultures. How much of the culture is determined by the innate characteristics of the people that comprise it, and how much is determined by the environment in which those people live. Now, I'm no anthropologist, so my opinion on the matter probably isn't worth all that much. But I think I can say with reasonable confidence that the harsher the environment, the greater effect said environment has upon cultural development. And in this particular instance, and the subjects of this particular video, Arrakis is a very harsh and demanding environment. Welcome to Brainstorm Lore, and welcome to the Fremen of Dune. As usual, when one is confined to the original six Frank Herbert books, the origins of the Fremen are practically non-existent. The closest thing we have to even a trace of their origin is that the Fremen are descended from a group known as the Zen Sunni Wanderers, Zen Sunni being a religion that resulted from the amalgamation of, presumably, Zen Buddhism and Sunni Islam. The latter makes sense especially, considering how much of Fremen culture, and indeed the Fremen language, is derived from Arabic. However, it would be overly simplistic to simply say that the Fremen are Bedouin Arabs in space. As I alluded to earlier, Arrakis is a very demanding place to live. Hell, deserts in general are a demanding place to live, even when they don't have giant sandworms. And what a desert demands the most of its inhabitants is their water. Therefore, water conservation is what Fremen culture revolves around, above and beyond all else. This is best exemplified by the characteristic still suits worn by Fremen out in the open desert. The planetologist Liet Kynes describes the still suit thusly, quote, It's basically a micro sandwich, a high efficiency filter and heat exchange system. The skin contact layer is porous. Perspiration passes through it, having cooled the body, near normal evaporation process. The next two layers include heat exchange filaments and salt precipitators. Salt is reclaimed. The motions of the body, especially breathing, provide the pumping force. Reclaimed water circulates into catch pockets from which you draw through this tube of the clip at your neck. Urine and feces are processed in thigh pads. In the open desert, you wear this filter across your face, this tube in the nostrils, and these plugs to ensure a tight fit. Breathe in through the mouth filter, out through the nose tubes. With a Fremen suit in good working order, you won't lose more than a thimble full of moisture a day." End quote. Still suits come with gloves as well, but since gloves hinder dexterity, most Fremen eschew them in favor of rubbing their hands with the oil of leaves from the creosote bush, one of the few plants native to Arrakis, in order to prevent water loss through their hands. The Fremen have done this for so long that even their own bodies are adapted to the purpose of water conservation. Fremen blood coagulates much faster than normal, indeed almost instantly, so that no water is lost through bleeding. And speaking of blood, when a Fremen is dead, his body is taken away immediately and processed so that all his water is extracted. This water is then given over to the communal store so that all the tribe may use it should they need to. As the Fremen themselves like to say, a man's flesh is his own, but his water belongs to the tribe. Unsurprisingly, 
Stealing water is the most heinous of crimes that a Fremen may commit. Perhaps the most infamous example was the case of Siege Jakarutu. Long ago, so it is said, the men of Jakarutu had made a habit of killing other Fremen and then taking the water from their dead bodies. Outraged by this transgression, the other tribes united against the Jakarutu, branding them with the term Idwali, meaning water insects. The combined tribal forces destroyed Siege Jakarutu, and indeed the name itself became verboten among the Fremen for generations to come. But what is a Siege exactly? Siege is the word used to describe the villages of the Fremen. Usually these are built into mountains or rocky outcroppings in the desert, as stone is the one place where sandworms will not go. The Siege itself is usually built into caverns beneath the rock, either natural or man-made, safe from the heat and intense light of the sun. Village might be the wrong word to use, however. One, because Fremen sieges can be large enough to support hundreds or even thousands of families, and two, because a siege is anything but a primitive community. Besides family dwellings, small farms, and water reservoirs, a siege contains many industrial necessities. Facilities devoted to the manufacturing of still suits, tools, and weapons, as well as their maintenance. Processing facilities for food, water, and spice. And power generators for energy. All the requirements and even a few of the small comforts of a modern, albeit minimalist, society. That said, while this technology and infrastructure belies the often ignorant condemnation of the Fremen as primitives, many of their social and cultural norms seem only to confirm these suppositions. In an environment where survival is the highest priority, the Fremen respect strength and strength alone. Consequently, the Naib, the leader of the Siege, is usually the strongest Fremen of his community. And the only way that he can be unseated from his power is by Tahadi, a traditional and ceremonial duel to the death. Tahadi can also be invoked in personal disputes, such as a Fremen man desiring the wife of another, or if he feels his personal honor has been slighted. Such duels are always to the death, and in keeping with the Fremen's obsession with water conservation, the water of the dead loser is often given to the winner to refresh himself after his exertions. Because sandworms are sensitive to the Holtzman particles, which are used in all modern weapons and technology, such things are impossible for usage among the Fremen. As such, the weapon of choice in war and in other disputes is the Chris knife, made from the teeth of sandworms. A crease knife is often 20 centimeters long, curved, and double-edged. Its sharpness is said to be unparalleled by any other thing in the universe. As an added bonus, the tip of the crease knife is hollow, and this hollow, which used to contain the nerve endings of the sandworm, can be used to contain poison. The Fremen hold the crease knife to be sacred, and believe that if drawn, it cannot be resheathed until it has spilled blood. Outsiders are strictly prohibited from seeing a Chris knife out of its sheath. Violation of this transgression can only be mitigated in two ways, either by the death of the transgressor or that person undergoing an elaborate cleansing ritual. As the Chris knife is sacred, so too is the creature that it comes from. Sandworms form an essential role in the Fremen religion. The creatures are believed to be the embodiment of God and are referred to by such names as the Maker and Shai Halud, which means either the Old Man of the Desert or Old Father Eternity. Such are the Fremen as they once were, a fierce, independent people, hardy and unbending. But that all changed when the fate of the Fremen people became entwined with the fate of the one called Paul Muadib. After his family were treacherously destroyed by the Harkonnens with the consent of the Emperor, Paul and his mother Jessica were forced to flee to the desert and ultimately found refuge among a Fremen siege and its leader Stilgar. Their acceptance into the tribe was remarkably easy, but that was no coincidence. The groundwork had been laid centuries before by the Bene Gesserit and its policy of the Missionara Protectiva a policy of spreading prophecies and superstitions among native populations so that they will already be predisposed to helping the Bene Gesserit should one of its number need protection or aid. In the Fremen's case, the prophecy spoke of a prescient man, 
from beyond the stars, the son of a Bene Gesserit, who would come to lead them into freedom. This chosen one was referred to as the Lisan al-Gaib, the voice from beyond the stars. And he was depicted as a messianic figure who would save the Fremen from oppression and lead them to paradise. Well, Paul was prescient thanks to his Bene Gesserit training, and his mother was one of the sisterhood. And so, even before he was forced to seek refuge among the Fremen, many already believed him to be the chosen one that had been long prophesied. Paul, seeking revenge against the Harkonnens, was willing to use these superstitions to his advantage, only to discover at the last minute, far too late to do anything about it, that by wrapping himself up in these traditions, he had become as much a slave to them, as much a prisoner of them, as the Fremen were. Even as Emperor of the Galaxy, Paul was unable to command his Fremen not to unleash the Jihad upon the galaxy, which resulted in 61 billion deaths. To quote another king from another universe, My lords made me a king, and they can just as easily unmake me. Paul's prescience had shown him visions of the future, which he referred to as his terrible purpose. They showed him a way forward, a future that would ensure humanity's survival, but it would come at a terrible cost, a price in death and tyranny, a price that he was not willing to pay. His son, on the other hand, was. Emperor Leto II called this potential salvation of humanity the Golden Path, and he was willing to go to any length to achieve it. His first step was to hijack the Bene Gesserit breeding program, but instead of trying to produce another Kwisatz Haderach, Leto II sought to achieve a human who could not be detected by prescience. He feared an undisclosed great enemy in the distant future, and that that enemy would use prescience to hunt down humanity and destroy it. Thus, his goal was to breed humans that could not be detected by such means. It took over 3,000 years, but eventually Leto's breeding program bore fruit in the form of Siona Artreides. The second part of Leto's plan was to impose oppression upon humanity. Frank Herbert, speaking through his character, understood the human tendency to unthinkingly follow powerful, charismatic leaders, even if those leaders should prove to be tyrants. By suppressing humanity as he did, by imposing 3,000 years plus of stagnation, Leto intended to impose upon humanity a revulsion of such leaders as he. In the end, even Leto's death was in service to his plan. After Leto's assassination, the sand trout that had attached themselves to his body separated from him and began the process of converting Arrakis, by this time green and wet, back into a desert world and resuming the spice cycle. Humanity, freed from his oppressive rule, now spread out across the stars in the Great Scattering, ensuring humanity's continued survival. By this time, though, the Fremen had almost ceased to be. By this time, they were little more than museum curios, their traditions reduced to meaningless ritual and formality. But not all hope was truly lost. By heretics of Dune, a thousand years had passed. Arrakis was a desert once more, and there were some Fremen who still remembered the old ways and kept the old values, ensuring that their way would still live on, however reduced they may have once been. Unfortunately, the honored Matres wound up sterilizing Arrakis, eradicating all life, except for a single girl, Shiana, and a single sandworm that were spirited away by the Bene Gesserit just in time. The Bene Gesserit's plan was that the sandworm would be brought to the world of Chapter House and used to create a new spice cycle, thus converting Chapter House into another Arrakis. As for the fate of Shiana, that will have to wait until I decide to cover the expanded Dune books, as, tragically, Frank Herbert never got to finish his saga in his own words. But for now, we must leave the world of sand and spice and travel back to a world of ice and fire. Until then. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, and check out our website at studiobrainstorm.net. And if you have a story that you think is worth telling, we are more than happy to help you publish it. Thank you, and have a nice day.